Uh, for those of you that, uh, due to traffic and other issues, have just managed to get here, um, let me welcome you to the application of One Health Approach to Global Health Centers Conference uh, at, Albert, at Albert Einstein. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Lewis Weiss. I'm one of the co-directors of the Einstein Global Health Center. Uh, and then uh, Jacqueline uh, Akar is the other co-director, and Jill Ralphman is the associate um, director of, of, of the Global Health Center and our partners in EcoHealth, uh, Catherine and Dr. Gresh and so on, who were here. Uh, first order, I just want to say, uh, if those of you who saw the films, uh, which were kindly provided through the CUGH uh, mechanism, those films are available for use uh, if you want to use them for other things uh, in terms of at your own institutions. In addition, we will be posting the links to those films on the Einstein website along with the videography from this meeting um, and uh, along from other resources related to this meeting. So if you are curious, if you went to see water and you're curious what coffee was about or you're curious what the mining film was about, because they're interesting, they are very interesting little films, the links will all be there so that you can see them. And we do have tweeting available. For those of you that are uh, tweeters uh, or birds of varying feathers, and we do encourage you, please, if you're going to tweet to live tweet, and it's uh, hashtag Einstein OH 2018. And the final thing is this is uh, the sort of clinical practice session, and I'm going to turn it over to another Vanna White who will point. Just like me, that's my job, by the way. Jill is the brains, and I am merely the pretty face that points. So we're going to replace me with another pretty face or another pointer, and that's Dr. Larson, who also will give a talk. So she's not just a pointer. So I think we've, had, we've really set the stage quite nicely today in terms of looking at um, what One Health is, what it isn't, um, how we might want to think about it. And so for this afternoon, um, we're moving into focusing on four case studies of how, what One Health looks like um, uh, in the field, um, at the bench, um, and so we've got four case studies for that. We'll have a break and then we'll dive into some clinical applications of that. So our first speaker um, uh, uh, will be talking about sentinel detection of human health threats, uh, Dr. Mazet. Well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Jonah Mazet. I'm a professor and uh, of epidemiology at the University of California, Davis, and the director of the One Health Institute. But I'm here today to talk to you um, and uh, be the front man for an amazing consortium of individuals who are working sort of at the front lines of One Health um, in, in more than 35 countries, including EcoHealth. And I want to give a shout out um, for, to Catherine, uh, all of the wonderful organizers for today, but especially I think I've seen uh, what wonderful speakers you were able to get here, and I just want to credit Catherine's infectious enthusiasm that reminds us and keeps us all collaborating. So thanks to you, Catherine. Yeah, a little, a little thank you for that. All right. So, um, so why I'm going to talk to you about the Predict project, and um, Catherine suggested we we think about it from a, the Sentinel host perspective, and we are talking about zoonotic viruses primarily, um, or those viruses that we think might become zoonotic, or maybe are causing low levels of spillover and or disease that go unrecognized. And what can we and should we do with that information? And we've kind of adjusted our uh, Venn diagram. There's been lots of circles this morning, right? And I'm going to talk actually at the kind of last minute. I was asked to do something on core competencies from another part of our work. And so I'm going to save the sort of reason why my Venn diagram is looking different um, for that talk. 
Um, but but the bottom line for why we're talking about the Sentinel piece, I think you're a very well-educated audience on this. Um, but when we think about the drivers of emerging infectious disease, we have to think about land use, human population growth, all of those other pieces, those environmental drivers um, that are both changing the way we act and behave at um, sort of transmission interfaces and allowing or forcing increased contact or increased share resources like water um, for those of you who are at the water movie over lunch and that allows for an enhanced flow of pathogens and and health risks and health risks primarily to whatever uh, virus is spilling over um, and so when we spill over out of the evolutionary host into a naive or susceptible host, we start to see disease. And so um, where you want to look at sentinels, the traditional definition, looking at those early detections of disease is one way to think about it. It's the way we think about it in medicine. I am a veterinarian as well as an epidemiologist, not an MD though. Um, and um, we think about sentinel surveillance in that way, and we're doing that here. But I also want to challenge us to think about if there are other sentinels, if there are sentinel behaviors, if there are sentinels that we could be picking up in our human health clinics. Um, but anyway, those diseases, when they do happen, impact our livelihoods and, and cause economic pressures that unfortunately tend to drive us again, either into new industries, cottage industries that put us at risk, or out and away from um, our current sort of balanced ecosystems. And whenever we upset our ecosystems by more animals, more people moving in and out of where we are experienced or our immune systems are experienced, we again have that possibility of finding an emerging infectious disease. And of course, one of the, the drivers or the human behavior that we have to think about um, when we're thinking about the global health issues is really global travel and trade. I've been on a plane more than uh, in a bed over the last two weeks. Uh, and, uh, and so I feel like I'm a, probably a great sentinel or super spreader, but we'll talk about that later. Okay, and this is the, um, this is the amazing uh, consortium that I get to work with. I can't get them all on the slides because um, we are uh, working uh, from UC Davis and EcoHealth Alliance, but with um, Wildlife Conservation Society, Metabiota, Smithsonian Institution, Columbia University, U UCSF, ProMed, big partner, HealthMap, big partners, um, but with also all the ministries in the 35 countries where we've been working. We're working outside of the US and Canada now in about 28 LMICs, um, but over the years, the last nine years, we've been working in even more than that. That's all funded by US Agency for international development and development is the focus there and I think that's also an important point that means while we are looking to identify the behaviors the risks the transmission interfaces as well as the viruses that might cause epidemics and pandemics in people we are strengthening the capacity in those countries where we're working to um, really be able to detect real time when they have an infectious agent or characterize and identify new pathogens that might spill over. That protects them, that protects everyone, because maybe then we can start to halt viruses more at their source or stop outbreaks when they're smaller, get them under control, instead of waiting for them to spread and get recognized by the international community. Okay, so this is kind of just the, the the beginnings of how we started, and we worked on the probabilistic modeling. Um, and again, our EcoHealth team and our UC Davis teams really lead that probabilistic model modeling to help us target where we would start surveillance. Now, if we have great data on where diseases emerge, we could do a great job at that, couldn't we? But until we have great data, we can only use the best information that's out there. And that's gonna be historically where things have emerged before, how things are changing, what puts us at risk, what large scale factors, environmental, demographic, and other can we identify? We use those to help identify country level um, uh, risk 
threats, and that tended to put us in places where um, people and animals come together in intimate ways, but in places also that might have less infrastructure in their health systems, in their surveillance systems, um, as well as high biodiversity. You put all that together, you really get the tropics. And then you add in that our, our uh, big One Health funder, really trying to push this agenda, USAID, also has a portfolio and political concerns, and where they work is not always completely going to be driven by the science. But unfortunately, there are many more places in the world that need this work than it can be done at any one time. Um, so there were plenty to to choose from that fit their portfolios. Then we get out in the field and do intensive field studies. What are we doing there? Are we looking for virus? We are, but we're really looking at those interfaces that facilitate the spillover of those viruses. So it's not just finding virus and saying, wow, we have a new viral discovery. It's identifying the high risk characteristics of the circumstances at that interface that might allow for transmission. So by doing that, we only actually look at samples that are likely to be the transmission sample. So we could go into these places if we weren't such conservation-oriented organizations, we might kill all the wildlife that we think are at risk in our study and sample every organ and everything. We don't do that. If we're looking at rodents that are contaminating food, we're going to look at urine and feces, primarily maybe saliva of the rodents, because that's how the transmission will happen. If it's in their liver, I don't really care unless people are eating them. And if they are, then we can go to the markets and we can sample the food because all of the handling between the animal being captured and killed and it getting to market may also deactivate some of those viruses and put them at lower risk. So it's a very transmission-oriented um, process that we go through. But then once you get those samples and you're looking for those viruses, how do you look for the things that you don't know what they are yet? And you do that in um, some of the lowest resource settings in the world. So we had to come up with a platform um, that worked using equipment that they might already have or, or reagents that could be sourced locally to try and have a sustainable, again, a development platform. We're not just exporting all these samples to the US and doing all this work here. We're building the capacity for them to do it for the long term, and so we needed things that worked and were affordable. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then all that data gets back into those probabilistic models and hopefully makes them even better. So as we uh, think about the world, this is the first iteration of the Jones et al. Uh, visualized uh, hotspot map, and we have a new one. It just doesn't look as pretty in Google Earth, so I like this one. Um, but uh, but it's, it's similar. We're starting to see that it's not just those things that I mentioned, the high population growth, the biodiversity, but it's also the changing land use. Not where land use has changed so much as where it is changing, which goes back to that point um, that we need to be watching emerging economies and as people are changing their agriculture um, we need more agriculture at the table we were having some uh, nice Greg Gray and I were talking today about where where is big ag in this story where are they in the room anybody from big ag here see that was just like a shill no right um, so so we really want to to move and and engage those sectors that are still missing from this conversation. But what were we able to do? Well, first and foremost, we were able to, to work with the countries to identify and train their surveillance people to be thinking more broadly than just human disease, thinking about feel, in the field how transmission is happening, going upstream. That works during outbreaks to try and source where the, the source of the infection is coming from. But it, even better yet, it is uh, possible to do that work in advance and start to identify the threats and the transmission interfaces early. Um, and, oh, by the way, this workforce that we've been training and working with in these countries, these 35 countries, they are the ones that get called out often by their countries to be the technical export experts when there is an outbreak. They get called in to the emergency ops centers or they get deployed out in the field because people need to know how to put on PPE properly. People need to understand um, where risk, you know, change the way that we view risk um, and know where to look. And so our teams have responded, I think, to more than 50 outbreaks now in the last nine years with their country governments. 
and then as I mentioned that laboratory platform and um, and we actually uh, used as our primary um, uh, platform a conventional PCR we had some people saying hey don't we don't want to go backwards we want to go to metagenomics and we said that's all good how's your bioinformatic platform you know you could somebody might have given you a piece of equipment does it work because if you're not using it constantly it may not be functioning do you have a um, do you have a contract to, to maintain it and keep it up and and um, so there were a lot of constraints so of course we all all of us in our own labs and um, wherever we want the next generation best thing but we should be careful I guess as uh, many of you are educators be careful to um, also tell the stories to our students to remember to be innovative and use tools to their full extent maybe in ways that they haven't been used before so we we're able to create a um, catalog if you will or um, a, a, a we call them protocols, for about 25 viral families using uh, consensus PCR, looking at conserved sequence, and then therefore we could rapidly extract and, um, and pull out almost all of the viruses in the viral families that have been known to cause disease in humans that go between animals and humans. So almost every disease that's caused an epidemic, a pandemic, or even disease where we could document the transmission between animals and humans. And then once you get a, a presumptive PCR positive, then you do have to go ahead and clone and sequence and get that material done. But that can be very done very quickly, either in country or outsourced to folks like Macrogen and others at a very low cost. So trying to come up with sustainable platforms. We also do a subset on the metagenomics or next gen sequencing, and we're always trying out new techniques. And what in a time when we have more time than this, I will talk about um, the, the benefits, pros and cons of that. But over the years, we sort of were asked to, um, to, to squeeze down into those filoviruses, influenza viruses, coronaviruses, flaviviruses, and um, paramyxoviruses, then all the rest. Uh, we still do, again, on a subset, but we hit those, all the big 24, 25 viral families really early, and then now we're, we're sort of honing down because we're in, really interested in characterizing the risks at the transmission interfaces even more. And these are what some of those look like. This is um, one of our sampling sites in Nepal that is also a big food producing site for this, the city of Kathmandu. Um, and this is, we call it sometimes, uh, this is from uh, my colleague Chris Crater Johnson, we call it the, the flu of death, you know, uh, sort of slide of death. So this is right outside the doorway to these people's kitchen. Um, and um, there are rodents, more shrews, frankly, than rodents running back and forth, um, as well as ducks and eggs and everything else. So the, the, the mixing vessels that we worry about so much in our laboratories, I think there are so many natural places where this can be happening. Then we're also looking at industries like uh, guano farming. that You can see here a photo from Southeast Asia. And then just urban um, situations where people are living in close contact, especially in South Asia, um, where uh, primates are revered and interacting with people on a regular uh, basis, especially when they're worshiping. And when we start to think about it and we refine our models, we still see that rodents, non-human primates, and bats are super important in this um, in this uh, emerging infectious disease paradigm. And the bats uh, certainly are living with people, and uh, we heard about them urinating and defecating on people as they, they do their work. They are urinating and defecating on people as they walk to work, frankly, people like you and me. So they're very common in the cities and people are eating them. So these are bats at market. Um, they are just, um, I think this I might have gotten from Billy, um, who I know gave you a really wonderful uh, introduction to One Health, but they're, they're not cooked and they're not smoked. So they're very potentially big infectious source. They're just seared to get all the hair off. So they look like they're cooked and then people are a little less worried about them from an infectious perspective. So a couple uh, just 
quick stories to tell you in case you think like, yeah, yeah, that's all nice, but that's just weird stuff that's happening out there, probably not our most critical thing to do. I don't argue that looking for new infections before they're causing huge problems is the most important thing to do. I'm just saying it should be part of what we're doing. We should be working on all the big global health threats that are known, but we should also at the same time and with the same systems be getting ready for the unknown. So we are finding things like a like um, virus in Uganda and bats when we found it in this bat we also found that that bat wasn't known so that contributes to conservation and biodiversity knowledge as well um, we can start to map the distribution of those bats and start to understand where there might be risk for evolution or spillover of coronaviruses and though that that map matches very well with the camel breeding and camel trade into um, into the Middle East uh, we've also found recently a novel Ebola virus in Sierra Leone, a brand new Ebola virus. Looks like it has all of the equipment to infect human cells. Has it been causing disease? We don't know. There are some papers that came out a little bit before us finding this virus that looks like pigs have some serologic evidence of something new, a new kind of Ebola virus in that same region. So now we're doing further work with the government of Sierra Leone to characterize. But while we're doing that, we're working with communities so that they have the knowledge that they need to be able to limit their contact with bats should they decide to do so, and it, that power is in their hands. If you look at it, our, our new one here is in the yellow there, and it just sits right nicely inside the Ebola viruses um, uh, and the, next to Marburg, the rest of the filovirus family. Um, and those are just examples, but we've really, uh, and this is a slide needs to be updated from just a, a few weeks ago, but we found over a thousand novel viruses in these viral families. Um, and while we're doing that, about 20% of what we find are known pathogens or known viruses as well. So the countries are able to not only detect the new ones, but the knowns at the same time. And some of the knowns are in new interfaces or new countries that didn't know they had them, which is very important. So we're improving the map from a global health perspective, but we're also improving the risk knowledge for the countries themselves. I think more important to that is the, is the foreign, 4,300 people that we've trained to be safe and be leaders in their countries, and the more than 60 labs that we've strengthened. Okay, so where does that go? Um, just to finish up here, hopefully soon I'll be able to ask you to help um, everybody else with the viruses that you're finding too. We're coming up with paradigms now because we're finding so many viruses on how to risk them to say which ones are ones that countries might follow and um, understand better and put even potentially into their surveillance schemes. And we're doing that not just in the traditional way where we only looked at a few viral characteristics, but we're looking at those epidemiologic and ecologic um, circumstances in which those viruses exist and trying to get a handle on um, what what are those characteristics that encourage spillover? And we're coming up with both a paper using expert opinion, all of the scientific evidence that we have been able to find to date. This is a multi-year, it's been about five years in the making to find all of that data and, and evaluate it and then using our existing viruses from PREDICT as well as global data. And the citizen science is what I'm hoping will be um, really useful, and that is as the world is finding new viruses, I hope that people will start contributing and looking at those together. So we're making a website that makes a risk score for those viruses, and if you check your credit score, you might recognize this interface. Um, so, um, so it's very much like that, but instead of those factors that ding you on your credit score, we're looking at host, environment, and viral characteristics, and giving people and countries can search just on their country. People who like coronaviruses can search just on that and start to get that risk score. We've identified 40 different factors, and if you want to submit your own virus, you only have to submit on a few basic things, and then we have we have databases that pull the rest of the information for you. So it's not it's not a big high. Uh, you don't have to characterize all those. 40 40 factors on your own, but you can then see how the database has populated those 40 factors and go in and adjust them if you don't like them. Okay, finally, um, we've been able to, with PREDICT, start to get a handle on how many animals and where you need to sample to find 
almost all of the viral threats that are out there. And um, that's a new initiative and global momentum builder called the Global Virome Project. But because of PREDICT, it's not such an unknown. It's not the starry slide, it's the focused in on slide, where we actually now know that it is feasible and it would cost less than 10% of a single large outbreak response to know almost every virus in those 24 viral families that are likely to infect us. Shouldn't we know how much virus is out there? We know the bacteria that are out there. Shouldn't we know the viruses too? And um, that's what's behind the Global Virome Project, and I'd be happy to talk to you, any of you who are interested in working on that more um, at any of the breaks or later. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is going to be talking about um, uh, the uh, Rift Valley Project and uh, work on that. I think this is really uh, fascinating studies. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone so much um, for the invitation to present here and also for coming to this presentation. I'm going to be presenting a case study of two different diseases that um, I'd like to talk about today and how we really use those One Health uh, approach to understand these diseases. The two diseases are going to be Rift Valley Fever Virus and the second one will be Nipah Virus. So just some background on Rift Valley Fever Virus. It is endemic to Africa. Um, all these countries in dark green, those are countries that have had multiple outbreaks of Rift Valley Fever Virus. Um, two other countries that are in dark green that you might notice are not in Africa are Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And in 2000, there was an um, outbreak of Rift in those two countries. And that was the first time the virus had been identified outside of Africa. But we're going to be focusing a lot on South Africa. And you can see here there are a lot of numbers right here, uh, which indicates that they had quite a few outbreaks. Um, however, the numbers are pretty far apart. And so a lot of these countries, the outbreaks occur about every 7 to 15 years, which is a long enough time to sort of have producers and policymakers potentially um, lose that memory of that last outbreak that they had to deal with. Um, Rift Valley fever virus has devastating effects on livestock and can have really bad economic effects, particularly for individual farmers, because the virus will cause abortion storms in the livestock and any pregnant animals, and also cause the death of any very, very young animals that were just born. So it can really impact people, their livelihoods, food security, um, and the economic economy of the countries. In people, the clinical picture is, is this. The fever, headaches, muscle pains, nausea, really flu-like symptoms um, for most people. A few people will get light sensitivity, retinitis, watery eyes, and then very few people can get hemorrhagic fever, encephalitis, and necrotic hepatitis. Um, most people are, get the virus through handling infected animals or um, slaughtering the animals, so abattoirs are at high risk. And then the veterinarians, the farm workers, the farmers, those people are really the people at risk for helping with these abortions that the animals are going through, and they can become infected that way. It is spread by mosquitoes as well, so there's potential for humans to get infected through mosquitoes. However, um, most people still have this animal contact, and we think that that's a really important factor. Amongst animals, the virus is definitely transmitted by mosquitoes. And some of these mosquito species, particularly the floodwater Aedes mosquitoes, are able to transmit the virus through their eggs. And it's hypothesized that the virus can potentially wait quite a long time in those eggs until the next flooding event when the eggs hatch and they will have the virus um, in the adult mosquitoes that are hatched from those eggs. So Rift Valley fever virus, because it depends on those floods, it also has been correlated um, with El Nino in East Africa and a lot of flooding um, events. And so this is work that um, Dr. Anyamba, who will be presenting tomorrow, um, has done quite a while ago, correlating these East African outbreaks with El Nino. And he'll talk a little bit more about his work um, on climate and Rift Valley fever. So basically, we know we have these mosquitoes. They can infect any number of ruminant species, which are um, cattle, sheep, goats, and also wildlife. We don't know exactly what role the wildlife play in spreading the, the virus and how badly they're impacted by the virus, 
um, because the research just hasn't been done on them, but they potentially have a role to play in the maintenance of the virus. And then from that, we also know people can become infected. So the project that I'm um, just sort of demonstrating the, the way that we're approaching this um, is called Understanding Rift Valley Fever Virus in South Africa. And we began the project in 2014. We have three primary goals in this project. And one is to understand the role of herd immunity um, through antibody titer levels in ruminants and whether or not an outbreak could occur in sort of supporting the mathematical models of Rift Valley fever virus to de determine whether or not an outbreak will occur if the animals are immune or if they're losing that immunity very rapidly. We want to identify factors associated with the abundance and succession of the mosquitoes. These floodwater mosquitoes that I mentioned can um, spread the virus through their eggs. And then we also want to describe the serological patterns of rift exposure in people with these high-risk occupations. So as a project, um, when we designed the project, we, we sat down to really think about this in a One Health manner. And we know, of course, um, that mosquitoes were um, obviously very important to the virus um, and to understanding how the ecology of the virus. We know that it's correlated with weather and climate events and flooding. We know that the sheep and ruminants can be very important and they're very susceptible to this virus and can have some devastating impacts on their populations. And of course, people are also infected. But what we didn't know, there's two more pieces here to the puzzle that we think are potentially quite important. And this is bringing in the environmental side of things to that. So those two pieces are vegetation and soil. And the reason we think these are very important is because these mosquitoes will lay their eggs on the, right directly on the substrate of the, the ground, basically. And they'll sit on that soil, potentially up to a year or longer. We don't know how long these eggs can last and they will then hatch out the next time it floods. And so we don't know if there's any factors um, that affect whether or not those eggs and therefore that virus can survive there and how any of the chemistries or pH of the soil or even the root structure of the plants might impact whether or not in, um, those eggs can remain viable in that area. So we think it's really important. So we've set up this project where we have experts in all of these fields who are leading different areas of the project and then now in this fifth year of the project, we're actually working all together to integrate the data that we've gathered on all these areas. So I'm happy, I'm not gonna go into much about the findings that we've had on this project. I'm happy to discuss them um, later at a break or something, but I wanted to just demonstrate how we sort of decided to come at Rift Valley Fever with this One Health approach. I'm gonna change gears a little bit to talk about Nipah virus specifically Nipah virus in Bangladesh, where EcoHealth Alliance has a long history of working um, with uh, the ministries of health and forestry and also collaborators there like ICDDRB. So the clinical picture for Nipah virus is fever uh, in humans, is fever, encephalitis, coughing, and it is quite fatal, up to 75% of patients, um, of case, it has a case fatality rate of up to 75%. Um, the uh, EcoHealth Alliance, doing work in Malaysia and in Bangladesh, along with their partners, have identified the flying fox, um, this guy up here, who is a, a, the largest fruit bat species um, as being the host and reservoir host of this virus. And we know also other domestic animal species can be infected and amplify the virus and infect people, including the, the pigs. So some of the work that EcoHealth Alliance has done with our partners in Bangladesh is to do a lot of serology work on these flying foxes and to identify whether or not they're shedding the virus and how frequently that happens. But one thing that was difficult um, that our partners in, in EcoHealth ran into was to try and figure out how the contact between the bats and the humans were taking place when we have cases of Nipah virus occurring. Because it wasn't um, as straightforward as um, people having reported contact with these bats. So one thing that um, the CDC and ICDDRB and the Ministry of Health were able to identify was that in certain seasons of the year, people in Bangladesh um, tend to have a delicacy called date palm sap, and they, they, it's, it's rather like maple syrup. 
So they, they like to collect that seasonally, and they just cut a gash into the tree and put a pot, um, which is right here, and a little spout. So the sap comes down and goes into the pot. They go up in the morning, collect that pot, and distribute it out to whomever wants a, a sweet treat on the way to school or um, to other participants or people who want to have um, a dessert. So our colleagues at ICDDRB set up these infrared cameras, and what we identified was that these flying foxes right here are coming there every night and enjoying the free snack that our people are providing for them by cutting the gash into the tree. And the, the lick the sap, they sometimes go in and drink straight out of the pot. Um, sometimes they then fall in and you have a dead flying fox in your pot. Um, there's video of them urinating in the pots. So plenty of ways to get contact um, between these bats and the people. So one of the things that this Nipah virus um, outbreak led Bangladesh to, and also several avian H5N1 avian influenza outbreaks, is to establish a One Health Secretariat in Bangladesh. This was established in 2017. It involves representation of the Ministry of Health, Family Welfare, Fisheries and Livestock, and the Environment, of, environment and Forestry. And really, this is one of the first countries that have been able to establish a funded government agency dedicated to One Health, um, which is great. We're hoping that they will expand that beyond just these three ministries and include some of the other ministries that we've discussed here. But the fact that they're already starting with this is really quite amazing. So for the One Health approach that they've taken for Nipah virus, they've established this One Health Secretariat. With that, they have integrated teams of human and animal surveillance, and they have active hospital surveillance. They've set up hot hotlines, so if there's a case of Nipah virus anywhere in the country, or suspected Nipah virus, they can call, and within 24 hours, a team of human and animal um, specialists, epidemiologists, will go out to that area in the country and start collecting samples. And through the PREDICT project that Jana was just speaking about, we've, um, our team in Bangladesh has responded to several of these outbreaks um, as wildlife experts. Um, so collecting samples from the flying foxes, even influenza samples. <laughs> In Bangladesh, they've also worked a lot on in integrating anthropological studies um, and developing simple interventions that can help prevent these disease spillover events. So they've worked a lot in developing health education, awareness messages through TV, radio, and newspapers, dis distributing um, brochures on Nipah virus infection, and improving community awareness within the um, Nipah belt area where we where the state palm sap gathering behavior and the flying foxes tend to overlap. And they will distribute this information pre and during outbreak seasons. And one of those simple interventions that I was talking about is illustrated in this picture right up here. So ICDDRB came up with this idea of developing these um, inexpensive bamboo skirts to place over the pots and it's a very easy method of preventing the bats from being able to access the raw date palm sap. And what we're trying to do is hopefully to improve the economics of the system by allowing these people to charge a premium for a bit safer date palm sap. And that will allow it to be funded so that they can actually um, make these bamboo skirts, which are not very expensive. They're like 35 cents or something. But it, it, it is in Bangladesh enough of an expense that most people aren't able to protect the date palm sap like this. So trying to integrate that a little bit into the local e economics. So the last little part of my presentation is just to talk a little bit about why we should, um, to give some support for why we should implement One Health. So one of these things is that um, using a One Health approach will actually potentially improve your, your statistical power. So we did a simulation. We developed a data set, um, a simulated data set. So we put the trend right directly into the data. And then we did some sampling to see if we could detect the trend. And we, this was for Rift Valley fever virus, and we have humans and their livestock being associated um, with serology results. So in the first simulation, we sample three times a year, but we sample the people and the animals at different time points. 
And you can see that when we run the simulation several hundred times, the overall trend is that there is um, no trend whatsoever. We can't see the trend that is there. But we know the trend is there because this is simulated data. We made it so that it is, in fact, there. However, if we use a One Health approach, we actually sample the animals at the same time as the people. And this way, we're able to detect the trend here. So by being able to detect the trend and using this approach, we actually increase the power of our analyses and we don't miss out uh, on this other trend. It's not to say that if you do post hoc putting human and animal data together, you won't find trends. It's just to say that if you start with the initial approach of doing the human and animal sampling together, you're more likely to find that, that association. And lastly, I just wanted to give some support for the resource efficiency of One Health. So with the Rift Valley Fever Virus Project, we did actually calculate out the transportation cost for Rift Valley Fever Virus um, Project over one year. We identified a health savings, a one health savings of about 35% on transportation just by having our teams go out together, knowing ahead of time that they were going to collect these samples and doing all of that work together. It's about a cost savings of about $6,500 which is not a lot necessarily here, but in some of these countries that we work in, that's a lot of money. That can pay someone's salary for, for a year in some countries. So that can be repurposed back into the project. So with that, I would like to acknowledge a, a lot of partners on the Rift Valley Project, and then EcoHealth Partners on the NEPARB work, and the One Health Secretariat in Bangladesh, and also the funding support that we have received, and answer any questions if there's time. Thanks. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about bacteria. Um, and uh, I'm here at Einstein. It's terrific to have everybody here for this conference. Um, I, my venture into One Health really, I think, is an accidental tourist. But it's been uh, about 13 or so years. And it's, it's been a pretty amazing um, experience. So I trained as a, classically trained as a bacterial geneticist and came to Einstein to work on tuberculosis and uh, was very interested in working on vaccines for, for tuberculosis and human tu tuberculosis um, starting out. And I think we're all familiar with the, with the, the burden of, of, of human TB. And um, we were really thinking um, when you have, you know, uh, you know, you look at different interventions um, for TB. Um, on the next coffee break, when you go upstairs, I'd love for you, when you go up and you look through the glass to your right, you will see this building here, Van Etten. And this was one of the last TB sanatoria that was built in the U.S. Uh, it was built in uh, 1952, so it's just right out the corner here. So if you're familiar with drug development, you'll know that a lot of the great drugs for treating TB came along in the, um, in the late 40s and the 50s. And so um, this became um, uh, obsolete, thankfully, um, after time. But TB didn't entirely go away. Prior to having that type of sanatorium, New York also had uh, this up at Saranac Lake, um, the Trudeau Institute. Um, and so fresh air and sunshine was the way to do it, to treat TB before drugs. And that, the little porches that you'll see that are still, uh, still on the building are, are, are part of that. Um, so and tuberculosis belongs to quite an uh, illustrious family of bacteria that, that, that cause disease. We have Brillie ulcer um, from ulcerans. We have leprosy from M. leprae. We have human TB, bovine TB, um, uh, deer TB from M. bovis. Um, and so there's really a lot of, of mycobacteria that are, that are out there. And so when we think about an infectious disease, you think about you want to do three things. You want to ask, you know, who, who, who has disease? How can we detect it? How can we diagnose it? Um, if you've got disease, how can we treat it? And the even better thing is, how can we prevent it? And that's really where vaccines come in. And so um, for, these, for these three areas, um, I want to focus a little bit on vaccine development, because that's really where, for me, I had a pivot point to really get into One Health approaches to things. So to think about um, some of our fundamental questions about TB vaccines, we need to go back about 100 years to two French scientists, Calmet and Guerin, who um, took uh, TB, took uh, M. bovis from a, a cow with mastitis and um, 
passaged it 231 times. Now you have to understand that mycobacteria on its best day, the slow growers replicate once a day. So it's not a typo that it was that many years to go, that many years to passage it. And because um, guinea pigs are exquisitely sensitive to um, uh, M. bovis infections and M. tuberculosis infections, that was sort of their sentinel to see if, it had, if they had attenuated the strain. And after time, they, they had. And, and that uh, Bacille Kemet Garin is BCG that we're all familiar with. And in 1929, it was endorsed by the, the uh, League of Nations as a, as a vaccine, as, as a worldwide vaccine. Um, and it was given to newborns. Um, and the results with BCG in humans are mixed. Um, it really is glass half empty, glass half full. Um, the biggest thing is, is it does protect against uh, human infants against TB meningitis. And it is, and, and it, it is given many, many places around the world. On the downside, the, the variable, uh, the efficacy can be quite variable depending on where, which strain of B BCG you have, what part of the world you're in, what kind of environmental mycobacteria are, are you're exposed to. And those really have not been accounted for in any of our vaccine development models. And most importantly, um, it can, uh, you know, obviously you look at the dates, 1908, 1921, 1929 way before HIV, and so BCG um, given to uh, immunosuppressed or HIV positive infant can cause a disseminated disease like, like TB, so there's, some, so there's some safety questions. So that led us to ask two really, really what we thought were simple questions. Um, you know, maybe 13 years or so later, they're still not very simple, but they're, they're quite fascinating. The first was, well, is BCG the best vaccine platform? And second, thinking about M. tuberculosis and M. bovis strains, um, would a human adapted um, M. tuberculosis strain that was uh, uh, a, a vaccine strain that was derived from an MTB strain protect better in humans than a TB strain that was derived, a vaccine st strain that was derived from BCG? And so um, with that, um, when Calmet and Garin were, were doing all of their um, uh, all of their growing and, and the passaging of M. bovis to attenuate it, um, we then, uh, you know, with modern sequencing methods, we're able to go back and sequence all the different BCG strains. And the thing that you'll find that's the one common deletion from M. bovis, virulent M. bovis, to, a BC, to a, the BCG strain is this RD1, this region of difference one. And that is the, the gold standard deletion that is in all BCG strains. Now, uh, getting back to where I said, depending on where, where you might have been in the world, um, what BCG strain you'd get would be a little bit different because when Calmet and Grins sent out BCG, nobody had lyophilization, refrigeration, freezers. Um, so it was each, each lab, each country would sort of grow things up and, and you would get this, these accumulations of all these really interesting mutations and deletions um, across all of these BCG strains. But we just wanted to ask the simple question, could we, you know, if we took a virulent TB strain, could we do, you know, basically, could we delete RD1 and, and see maybe that, that might be the platform for a better vaccine strain? And so we, um, what Calmet and Garin did, did with uh, many years and many passages, um, we took tools that were um, developed in Bill Jacobs' lab here at Einstein to make precise null gene deletions of the RD1 region, and then also we knocked out some biosynthetic genes that were essential. And then just wanted to say, okay, well, we've got the, the passaged BCG strain, we've got a rationally attenuated TB strain, um, how do those behave in terms of vaccines? And um, I was, uh, worked quite a bit and was very familiar with, we, we typically will test human TB vaccines in mice first, probably 98% of what we test is in mice. Things that look promising, a very small subset will go on to guinea pigs and then a very, very, very small subset candidates will go on to non-human primates for testing. And so that's sort of the paradigm that we go through with testing that. And um, that those first um, experiments to ask the question, could we make something you know, safer than BCG, better than BCG um, with, with the uh, rationally attenuated TB strains, um, it, was, it was mixed. It certainly was much safer than BCG. Um, our vaccine candidates didn't kill a skid mouse, they were safe in guinea pigs, they were safe in monkeys, but efficacy was not any better than BCG. So it was you know, sort of a little bit back to the drawing board. And while we had this data that was coming out, we had a really unusual connection that was made 
uh, from uh, people out at the National um, uh, Animal Disease Center, USDA, out in Ames, Iowa. And they were interested in developing better vaccines for bovine TB. And we're curious about how our you know, new vaccine might work out. And so that started a collaboration with, with Ray Waters there. And um, that's uh, not, does not look like our BSL-3 upstairs here with mice. This is a, this is a BSL-3 um, at, at USDA. And this is a, a aerosol infection of, of uh, uh, a cow that has been uh, previously vaccinated with either BCG or one of our vaccines. And so this, I have to tell you, was a huge paradigm shift for me to go from, you know, in the vaccine development world, human TB vaccine development world, there's just very specific little hoops you jump through to try to get a really good candidate. And it was a major pivot point to move on and say, okay, this is, this is really interesting. And it really, um, for me as a PhD, put me working with um, some amazing um, vets and, and veterinary, veterinary medicine researchers. And there were two things that we were looking at here. And one thing I loved about it in using that calf model is we could actually get, we could accrue some neonatal data. Um, and, and, you know, because with our previous models, models, I think neonatal mice, given their lifespan of being a neonate versus the bacteria and all of that is difficult. And I love this um, transition in thinking about, you know, you look at how um, uh, this portrait of this child is, is as a, just a short adult. Um, and here it's the proportion where it's actually a child and not a miniaturized adult. And so for me, that was also one of those things that was quite amazing about moving into other natural infection models that we got to a really accrue some really interesting neonatal data. And I should say with this, at the same time that we were going into the, the neonatal, um, uh, the, to the calves, we also were able to start going into neonatal macaques. And again, that was a whole nother set of information. And thinking about the original picture of Calmet and Gurin with the baby, the photo op of the, of the baby getting the, the vaccine, you want to think about, you know, what's your actual target model for some of these things that are going to go into. So, um, so with that, I was complaining to um, one of my program officers, Christine Sizemore, at NIH. You know, I said, where are all of, I've never met, you know, I hadn't met these people before, that I'd been doing all of these, the work with, with cattle, and it had moved on to deer and cats, and it was all kinds of stuff. And it was excellent, but it's like, I go to Keystone, I go to ASM, I go to an occasional Gordon conference, and I've never seen these people. And, and after she listened to me complain for about five minutes, she says, well, I think we should just put a meeting together. And so we did. So we decided to put a, we, it was going to be just a one-shot meeting called uh, Many Hosts of Mycobacteria. And, um, and uh, I need to give uh, uh, Tina Parker, who you'll be hearing from uh, uh, a little bit later on this afternoon, she's one of my co-organizers now with this, this meeting. And she, she did the most updated logo, so we've got all the different, um, different, different species. But we think a lot about experimental and um, a natural infection of mycobacteria. And again, getting back to leprosy, burley ulcer, bovine TB, human TB, we have all of these different models, all of these different mycobacteria. And the point of the meeting is to really bring together um, a lot of researchers that are in those different fields that we don't normally see each other at the same meetings. So we keep it very small, um, 70 to 90 people. It's discussion based. Um, we basically outlaw PowerPoint unless it's a really, really fantastic pathology slide. And those will, will you know, because you can only do so much with a, with a dry erase board. Um, but we also, we also stipulate at the very beginning, we acknowledge, you know, the thing that everybody talks their, starts their talks with of, this kills this many people and all of that. We stipulate all that at the beginning so nobody has to spend any time on that. But it's really a discussion question. It's to bring together, you, you've got someone sitting on a panel that is a infectious disease specialist that takes care of, of patients with XDRTB. You've got someone who runs a, a clinical pathology lab for med veterinary medicine. You've got a basic researcher. You really have a lot of different expertise and a lot of different perspective. And so, it's been a really, uh, really great um, experience here to be able to bring together those different um, perspectives. And what we thought was just going to be a one-off meeting has actually has actually um, grown. And we're we've got our eighth meeting coming up actually. And uh, so our first one was back in um, 2007, and our our next one will actually be here at Einstein um, this year. It'll be um, in March. So if you or a colleague is is interested or would benefit from this, please let me know because we. Love to have you part of the discussion. 
but each meeting we have a, a you know different location. So we were at USDA, we were at the former leprosy sanatorium, um, uh, we've been at uh, Primate Center, Lowry Park Zoo, Colorado State. Uh, we're here at Einstein, and we have a theme for different the different meetings, and it really is a pretty intensive two days of discussion where we're really, really sort of going with the big questions. The very first meeting that we had, we spent almost a day, I just posed to each person with each model, and I said, what does your model actually die from with their mycobacterial disease? And I, I thought that was gonna be like a two hour, maybe hour discussion, and we went on for the whole day, and it was really quite fascinating to get the perspective of things. Um, because it's such a small group, um, and we wanna keep it that way for discussion, we also wanna disseminate the the results and the, and the discussions, and so we published a book with Cabby Press um, a couple years ago, Many Hosts of Mycobacteria, and I love, we, it's about 40 chapters, it's a, it's a really terrific book, and I love the, the cover art, the, the cover photo that we got for it that really represents, you know, got the chickens there, the human, um, the cattle, and it really represents all the different parts of, of mycobacteria. And for this, um, I was able to, um, uh, as this was developing, I was also spending a lot of time on um, doing research in uh, South Africa on drug-resistant TB, XDR TB, and, and, and have some, some projects going with that that I don't, um, I'm not gonna go into today. But as part of that, um, I, I met uh, uh, Kathy Alexander, who's at Virginia Tech and also works in Northern <coughs> Botswana, and she um, works on um, mongoose. And uh, she had said, oh, you know, you should come, you should come see my, my, the, the lab and the field site. Um, and she, in working with mongoose, she had identified a brand new um, species of, of MTB complex um, called Mycobacterium mungi. And um, so we've now been collaborating for a number of years, and that just came out of that, the many host meeting. And um, I showed you a little bit, we were talking about TB, and then all the, you know, here you've got, you know, here are the various deletions that you have to get to M. bovis, and then we've got the BCG. So this is sort of where things fit. One of the things that's interesting to keep in mind about mycobacteria is, especially with the slow grain mycobacteria, there's no horizontal gene transfer. So it's really sort of like terminal differentiation or terminal deletion to get to where you are. So it makes it quite fascinating both in our human um, subjects as well as in, our, um, in, in any of our um, animal um, strains to be able to see what's happening. And this um, uh, mungi uh, that causes disease in, in uh, uh, banded mongoose um, is found here in, uh, in, what we did here is we just overlaid all of these wildlife associated um, MTB complex organisms um, where they are in Africa with some of their, some of the Africanum um, uh, uh, subspecies. And just to give an idea of where the, um, sort of where we know their hosts tend to be um, and where, the, where we've been able to find the bacteria. And so it's been a really fascinating um, uh, collaboration to try to work that out. And one of the things that was quite unexpected that came out of it is, um, you know, I think this, this cough, this uh, poster for, from the, you know, 1930s about TB is, is pretty, um, you know, pretty, it sums up the transmission model. It's, it's creating an aerosol, it's coughing, and that's, that's the, you know, uptake and the transmission of it, and, and that's very well known. Um, Kathy, from doing just some, some really amazing um, field work as well as some um, molecular biology, was able to show that even though um, this Mycobacterium mungi belongs to the MTB complex with all of the other um, uh, strains that, we've, that, that we're aware of, it has a very unique way of being able to uh, transmit TB. Um, and it, transmit it transmits it through, um, the transmission mechanism is, is anal gland secretions. And so there's scent marking and, and the um, social behavior that goes on in, in detecting those scent marks as new animals, or new animals within the same troop come into the area or check out the area. And that was a brand new, had not really even um, been described for um, a slow-growing mycobacteria or an MTB complex before. And so that was quite a fascinating um, uh, discovery. And, and with this, we were able to, um, uh, this is just a, is showing a bit of a, a phylogenetic tree of the different um, MTB complex organisms. And with mycobacteria and mungi, one of the things that we're still struggling with is so far, this is the only known M, uh, MTB complex species um, that we cannot get to grow in culture. And I have to tell you, it's driving us nuts. 
Um, we have tried supplementing with so many things. I have fantastic colleagues out at the USDA mycobacteriology lab there that's the reference lab for cattle, every, everything that's, that's mycobacteriological um, in, in the US and, and in North America. Um, and we've tried supplementing with all kinds of things. We finally were able to get um, enough DNA from a really heavily lesioned uh, liver sample that we were able to sequence that, and so we've got the whole genome sequence. And so we're, we're you know, looking to see if there's anything within that that gives us any clues as to what we might be able to supplement with to be able to, to um, get it to grow. Um, we also have a lot of samples, um, transcriptomic samples, and we're uh, having the, the um, genome of the mongoose sequenced because its nearest neighbor was a cat, and that's just not going to be as helpful. And we've got, we've got um, uh, in the field, we've got samples from, from the animals, and, and we want to look at the transcripts and see how does that compare to what we know about disease kinetics in humans. Um, and getting back to the very beginning where I was talking about BCG and RD1, one of the things that came out of the sequencing project that was absolutely fascinating was um, this RD1 region. So this is what's deleted in BCG. So when Calmet and Garin were passaging their M. bovis strain, this was the one deletion that, that happened in all of the strains. And then if you look at all of the different wildlife associated or animal adapted MTB complex strains, these are, this is Microti, um, Dassey bacillus, Sericati. They all have different RD1 deletions, and then um, Mycobacterium mungi has one also. It's got the smallest one that we see, um, but it's, it's, it's absolutely fascin fascinating to me that in these sort of terminally differentiated bacterial strains, this deletion has come up again and again, and I think it, um, you know, if you're curious what RD1 encodes for, it encodes for a specialized secretion system. And so um, there must be some kind of balance between pathogenicity and um, virulence and transmission. And I think this is something that, again, sort of takes us back almost 100 years to what um, Calmet and Garin uh, were able to pull out of, you know, livestock um, uh, samples to, um, to get us to this point. Um, I love one of my favorite poets is T.S. Eliot and from Four Quartets. Um, he writes, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of, our, all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And for me, I really think the, the One Health for me sort of has a, I, I've, I'm very impressed with all the different Venn diagrams, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the ex explanation of the, of, of the one. Um, but I think that, that taking the knowledge that you have, being iterative, pulling other people in, and then being able to extend Further, there's a lot that I don't think we would understand as well about how to um, deal with mycobacterial diseases if we did not have the way uh, mechanisms to be able to connect. And I think meetings like this, being able to um, see people that we may not see in our normal niche publications or our niche meetings um, is very is very helpful. Um, and I won't go through because um, I don't want to be hypocritical and go over time. Um, uh, lots of fantastic collaborators and, and people um, to work with over the years that have really um, uh, we've helped with various studies. Um, a lot of the, the people here that have been co-organizers for the different meetings over the years at the different sites. Um, I didn't have time to go into it, but we also use um, a little bit of viral virus surveillance in the sense of using finding um, mycobacterial phages or viruses with students in South Africa as a way, as a discovery project, to get them into um, uh, being excited and engaged about doing basic research. So that's a, a whole other project that, that, that we do in, in Durban. But, um, but I'm really grateful for um, a lot of uh, people that have really helped me personally, and I think helped the field be able to think a little bit more broadly um, about this. And um, I will, um, uh, I think we'll move on to the next, the next speaker, and we'll uh, do questions at the, at the end. Hi, my name is Ramanan Lakshminarayan, and um, so uh, I wasn't here this morning, but I'm sure that uh, the Jones et al. paper, the Nature paper, which talked about, you know, did come up, I'm sure, hard to have an eco-health conference without that paper being described. But uh, if you remember, in that paper, uh, I would say probably about 60% of the zoonotic infections were related to drug resistance. And so if you think of, uh, you know, the preponderance of the burden of, of sort of zoonotic infections, they really need to do with, with drug resistance. So the organizers wanted to talk me, me to talk about drivers of antibiotic resistance. And I thought I'll just get a little bit into 
just background on drug resistance. I didn't know what the, the full background of this crowd was. Uh, but just to remind you that, uh, that antimicrobial resistance has always been around, has always arisen just a few years after antibiotics were introduced. In the case of penicillin, in fact, it was uh, discovered in vitro uh, two years prior to when uh, penicillin was even used to treat the very first patient. Uh, and that first paper was, uh, was in 1940. 1942 was when the first patient was treated. And uh, after that, resistance has arisen pretty much to every uh, antibiotic uh, within a few years after it being introduced. Um, and truth be told, drug resistance is ancient. It's always been with us uh, because uh, the antibiotics that we have are derived from natural organisms which have been fighting bacteria uh, for billions of years, literally. And so it isn't surprising to have uh, resistance genes be identified in woolly mammoths or in polar bears or uh, you know, there was a paper last week uh, which showed uh, drug-resistant bacteria on the International Space Station. So they're everywhere, literally, because everywhere there are bacteria, you will find these. The big difference is that uh, where drug-resistant bacteria were in the frequency of, say, one in a hundred million or one in a billion, uh, which existed, uh, you know, a long time ago, that has really changed. And I'll play this very short video. Just it's, uh, you know, some of you may have seen it. It's uh, uh, it sort of shows uh, how drug resistance really works. So what we ended up building was basically a petri dish, except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right, it's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So remember, that short period of time was what? 11 days. So uh, I think that's as scary a short film as you'll ever see, right? <laughs> it's a true horror movie. Uh, and my talk is on the drivers of antibiotic resistance, and it's pretty much over. That's, that is it. This is what's going on. Uh, but I just want to give you a little bit of context on what's actually been happening in the real world as a result of this. So since the 1990s, I've you know, collected magazine covers on drug resistance. And uh, you know this has been always in the news. But this was during a period of time when antibiotics, you know, resistance was under 1%. There was a possibility of resistance, but it wasn't where it is right now. And in fact, you know, it's, uh, so you can see how old that is. It's Brad Pitt is on the cover, so it's ancient. So uh, obviously, really, it's been, it's been uh, described very widely, but this is what actually happened over the early 2000s, which is, um, you see, let's see, if, does it have a pointer? Ah, it does. Okay, so carbovenom resistance in, uh, in Klebsiella and third generation cephalosporin resistance. Notice it goes from less than 1% to, you know, uh, over 25% in both of these cases, you know, third generation cephalosporins as well. And that's really what happened over the 2000s, which is resistance started climbing rapidly. In fact, this short uh, uh, video again, uh, you know, 
based on our own data, carbapenem resistance in Acinetobacter. And you can see across the United States, it was close to, uh, you know, it's definitely under 10% across uh, most of the US, 10 to 20 in just, uh, in just the mountain states and, and parts of the Northeast. Uh, and if I play that forward, you can see that, you know, every successive year it starts going up. You get more than 40% initially in the Northeast. It starts moving up further, 2006, all across the country, it's 20 to 40% or higher. 2010, you reach greater than 60%. By the time you're finished, in just a period of 12 years, resistance moved from being essentially under 10% to being above 40% across most of the country and some places above 60%. Now, this is what, uh, you know, what was going on is essentially that these bugs were being selected for from one in 100 million. And when it got to one in 100 is when we pay attention to them because that's when resistance is 1%. But they don't stop at 1%. They keep going on. And in the grand scheme of things, uh, the time that it would take for them to get from 1% resistance to 50% resistance is really nothing at all, uh, given where they've really started from. So you see that repeatedly in data from the US. So these are carbapenem resistant interbacteria rates in kids. You again, you know, uh, we made the mistake of thinking this wasn't an issue. And then 2004, 2005 starts picking up gets to be 5% uh, in, uh, and you see that in uh, not just in US hospitals. These are data from one of the largest hospitals in Malawi. Again, see, it starts from very low, but notice the y-axis. This is 50, 60% level resistance in E. coli. So, sorry, in, uh, I can't see it very well, in Klebsiella. So it starts from zero, gets up to 60, even 80% resistance in Klebsiella for other, other uh, enterobacteries. So the same pattern is reflected around the world. Uh, and in fact, when you look across the world, MRSA rates are extraordinarily high. Russia, it's above 60%. It's above 80% in, in many parts of Latin America. Uh, if you look at extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli, uh, there's a huge hotspot in, in South and Southeast Asia, India, China, particularly. Uh, Iran has high levels of resistance as well. Um, and these are just countries that for which we actually have data. Uh, and carbapenem resistance, which is again the big concern in gram negatives in Klebsiella, uh, you can see uh, you know, uh, high levels of resistance. In fact, in places like Nepal, Iran, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's hard to find uh, carbapenem sensitive uh, pathogens, say newborns with sepsis. So uh, we update these all the time. So we have this website called Resistance Map, which uh, I've just plotted out for five countries just to show that uh, resistance is, is highly variable across countries. Uh, so some with lower levels of resistance, like the UK, for instance, take Pseudomonas, you see the UK is lower than Spain. Uh, the Mediterranean countries tend to be much higher. India, lots of antibiotic consumption, lots of background burden of infectious disease and consequently high levels of resistance. Uh, South Africa as well, and Vietnam, again, an area of concern. Uh, and that same Acinetobacter uh, picture, instead of if I just showed it to you as a map, you could see these are high levels of resistance, you know, exceeding 60% in the places with uh, most of the world's population, which are India, China. But you also see that in, uh, in Argentina, in Mexico, uh, generally in Latin America. And, uh, if you look at ESBL carriage rates across WHO regions, and these are just each circle represents an individual study, it's been going up over time. So it's been going up in most in the Southeast Asia region, but certainly across all regions. Uh, now, there's some bits of pockets of sort of reversal as well. So carbapenem resistance and acinetobacter went up, but and but it's you know in in uh, this is in in uh, in uh, in peds, so it starts coming down as well. So you don't necessarily have a, a monotonically increasing picture in all populations. So some populations where it changes a bit over time. Now, are we stating the, overstating the problem of resistance because we just look at tertiary care facilities where there's a lot of sick patients? Turns out not the case. So we actually see the same patterns whether we look at small community hospitals in the US or we look at tertiary care facilities. If anything, small community hospitals have higher levels of resistance than tertiary care facilities possibly because they don't necessarily have the same infection control support, they don't have stewardship committees. So, uh, you know, that's 
That's one possible explanation. Now, we don't know everything about the drivers of resistance, which is what the rest of my talk really is about. Uh, you know, we have these aberrations as well. India is a country in which a lot of penicillin has been used over the years, but even today, and this is 2017 study in Lancet Infectious Disease, 92% susceptibility to penicillin in pneumococcal isolates. We have no idea why. It's not susceptible in Nepal, in Bangladesh, or in Sri Lanka, but somehow when they hit the Indian border, they're just not able to cross. So we don't know. Um, yeah, no visas. Hard to get into India. So, uh, so number of unique beta lactamase enzymes identified, and we certainly know that that's been going up. So you think of you know this as the number of sort of keys that the bacteria have to unlock antibiotics. We're certainly putting a lot of you. We're certainly engendering a lot of these beta lactamase enzymes. And that's also putting at risk any new antibiotic that may, we may be able to come up with. Uh, MCR1, and this is sort of the, now the move into the human-animal interface part of the story. Because colistin was such a toxic drug, which was not really used for human medicine a lot, the uh, folks uh, you know, used it for growth promotion a fair bit. In fact, large quantities continue to get sold for, uh, for growth promotion uh, across most of the world, I would say, not, not in the US necessarily, but in other parts of the world. And uh, as a result, uh, we saw MCR1, uh, which conferred resistance to colistin, and this was in 2015. It didn't take very long. This is a 2016 paper where uh, you, know, you could see it in pretty much every country that you looked for, either in animals, humans, or in a combination of all of these. So. Uh, so the stuff spreads really fast, and now we have MCR 1, 2, 3, 4, I believe even 5. Now, a primary driver of, of uh, resistance is, of course, consumption. And uh, we're doing better at sort of being able to document consumption over time. And what we see is the geographical convergence in antibiotic consumption. And you see 2000 to 2015, the world go the world's going through a couple of major changes. One is that uh, antibiotic consumption is, is rising at a dramatic rate. Um, total consumption globally went up 66% just between 2000 and 2015. It doubled in, in uh, low and middle income countries. It was kind of flat in, in uh, the high income countries. Actually, you can see that here. But if I go back to this, the per capita consumption varies a lot. I mean, countries like Turkey consume nearly eight or nine times the amount that the Dominican Republic does or Central America does. Because today, lack of access to antibiotics still probably kills more people than drug resistance does. But that will change very soon because the folks at this end want to be using more antibiotics. And in many cases, appropriately so, because that represents an average. There's a lot of people who don't have access. And once they get access, it's going to push up consumption tremendously. And uh, we're going to see a lot more consumption in the coming years. In fact, we project. Uh, so this is high income countries. We see a convergence across all countries to same defined daily doses per thousand inhabitants per day. Um, and uh, if we look at current trends uh, and continued growth, our forecast is that you would have uh, about three times the amount of consumption in 2030, which is not that far away, compared to where we are in 2015. So uh, if we think that we've done all the damage we can with selection pressure, that's not quite true. So uh, countries with the highest increase in consumption, India, because of sheer size, uh, numbers of people. So uh, in terms of human consumption, it's, it's certainly the leading consumer of antibiotics. But again, when we get to the animals, completely different story where uh, um, we'll see very soon. So carbapenem, I showed you all those slides showing you know, high levels of resistance to carbapenem. Uh, you know, India, very high levels of uh, consumption. Pakistan, Egypt as well. Um, and you see that both in, I mean, this is truly uh, an issue which is in developed and developing countries. There's really not a, that much of a difference. Uh, carbapenem consumption has been going up across Europe as well. And the, the, the irony here is that as much as we are concerned about drug resistance, uh, it may inadvertently push people into using newer antibiotics which are not indicated because they fear that the older ones don't actually work. So it's a fine balance in communicating this because we want to communicate a problem, a threat, but not somehow push people into using antibiotics that they should not really be using. But a lot of that is certainly happening in Europe as well. 
Uh, Non-prescription use of antibiotics is a big driver. Uh, it's common not just in developing countries, it's common in, in Spain and Italy and Greece, which many Europeans might uh, consider developing countries um, on their continent. Um, and uh, that's because you, know, you just don't have enough doctors. This is what a doctor might look like, uh, but they're not actually medically trained doctors. It just means that someone spent three years as an apprentice to a doctor somewhere and they still have a clinic, but that's because you don't really have enough doctors per capita. That's the levels in India and China of doctors and nurses per thousand population. That's not even the level in South Africa. Forget about the US, which has far more, you know, 12.3. So it's hard to insist that people go to a doctor to get a prescription before they get an antibiotic, because we may inadvertently uh, you know, deny a lot of people who appropriately need, need antibiotics, access to antibiotics, just because they couldn't reach a doctor. Uh, in rural India or, say, rural Ghana, for instance, uh, the ratio of patients to doctors is, uh, so there's one per 40,000. So there's 40,000 people for every doctor. The ratio for the United States is about 500, one to 500. So um, it's, it's hard to, to make that comparison. Drivers of resistance, flu season, big, big driver of antibiotic consumption. Um, across the Northern Hemisphere, the peak month of consumption is January or February. It just jumps off the charts, and certainly in June, July, in the southern hemisphere, uh, because you know people get the sniffles, and uh, and a lot of people, you know, last week there was a, a poll that came out from uh, IDSA and Research America, which showed that 85% of Democrats and 85% of Republicans uh, thought that drug resistance was an important issue that required support. However, 40% of both of those categories uh, thought that antibiotics worked against viruses. So, uh, you know, go figure. They support <laughs> the issue, but they're not educated on it. So, uh, you know, and in fact, we had the study where we trained the data for three years, and then we used antibiotic consumption data to predict influenza, influenza-like illnesses. You can do almost a perfect fit. If we had antibiotic consumption data, we can tell you at any given time, any week, uh, how bad the flu season is. So great for tracking flu, bad for drug resistance. Um, and uh, so this is, uh, you know, so again, moving on to drivers, much of what we thought was true about um, uh, antibiotic use and resistance is also, uh, you know, a little more complicated now. For many years, there was this uh, well-known paper by Herman Goosens in The Lancet, which showed if you plotted outpatient use of penicillin by country in Europe and uh, penicillin non-susceptibility, that was you know, pretty much a straight line. And uh, you, know, you had France at one end, and you had uh, you know, the Netherlands at the other end, and uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty straightforward. You, know, you reduce use, you re reduce resistance. Um, and uh, you know, we believe that because uh, in, in stuff that we've done in the US, it sort of bears out. This is uh, uh, you know, antibiotic consumption, and these are seasonal patterns, and the resistance follows almost exactly uh, two months later. There's a very, very clear pattern matching use to resistance, and seasonality of prescribing does affect resistance rates. Uh, very, very good uh, match, and it does not, as it uh, happens, uh, associate with the with, uh, prevalence of viruses. So uh, we have a lot of data for developed countries showing this, but then what we realize is that uh, that's a different situation than it is across the rest of the world, where the interaction with animals, with aquaculture, uh, with sewage might be a little more uh, you know, proximal in, uh, in places where these are not necessarily uh, you know, all in different places. So you saw the you know the picture uh, of the the pigs and the and the chickens and and the rodents all together. So a couple of months ago, we published this paper in in, in Lancet Planetary Health, which looked across all of uh, the variables that we can think of that contributed to global antibiotic resistance. And um, and what we found was interesting that uh, I'll focus on this that use use of antibiotics was not. Uh, significantly associated with resistance when you looked across developing countries. Governance, you know, how good their systems were, uh, reduced resistance. If they spent more on health, that reduced resistance. Uh, if they spent, you know, they were wealthier, then they had more antibiotics, so that increased resistance. Uh, education did as well, and infrastructure. 
uh, was also negatively correlated with resistance, which seems to indicate that the story of what drives resistance is a very complex issue, which we don't really, we can't boil that down just to consumption. We could reduce antibiotic consumption globally by 30% today. I'm not sure that in societies where resistance genes exist in humans, animals, and can easily be transmitted, you know, both in the environment, but also inside hospitals where infection control might be poor, that you can necessarily solve the problem just with reducing consumption. Reducing consumption is important, but it's not the entire story. And transmission, reducing transmission of resistant pathogens might be a much more important part of that story in the short term, at least, uh, until you have systems which are, uh, you know, which resemble what you might see in Europe, for instance. Uh, because what we ask of antibiotics is very different across most of the world than, you know, in a sense, what was asked of them in the US. What I mean by that is first use of penicillin happened after crude infectious disease mortality had gone down by three quarters in the United States. It was not antibiotics that reduced infectious disease in the United States. It wasn't even vaccines. It was just public health, sanitation, it was chlorination, uh, hygiene, which really solved the problem. Now, today, crude infectious disease mortality in South Asia is two times what it was in the United States in 1942 when antibiotics were introduced. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it is three times. We are using antibiotics as a substitute for hygiene, water, and sanitation rather than as a mop-up after you've solved the problem with water, sanitation, hygiene, public health departments. That is simply not sustainable. So what we find, you know, what we found in the other papers is not that surprising when you th see it in this way, which is you can't really solve the problem of bacterial infections just with antibiotics. And that's effectively how we're trying to solve the problem across much of the world because the water and sanitation, water has improved a lot. Sanitation has not improved uh, nearly enough. Still high rates of open defecation, uh, you know, uh, insufficient treatment of sewage and so forth. Um, so finally, to animals, uh, we have a few minutes. So uh, start with pigs. Uh, you know, China now consumes six times the number of pigs that they did in 1975. The scale up in demand for animal protein is absolutely unprecedented. Uh, you know, and it's it's probably one of the defining sort of uh, environmental trends of our time, which is just the consumption of meat increase. Uh, you know, China has uh, not just six times the number of pigs of the US, but also actually owns the largest hog producer in the US. And if you look at the one mammal that consumes more antibiotics than any other, it's pigs in China. Because, uh, you know, China consumes half the world's antibiotics and most of them go to, uh, to, to hogs. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, so when we actually estimated this, this, this this figure was rejected by the journal. They said, you, you can't put that in the main paper because all that you're saying is that you know, Chinese uh, animals are consuming most of the antibiotics. So this is our estimates of, of antibiotic consumption in animals. Because the global consumption was 131,000 tons. Uh, about a third of it was just in China. And uh, it was projected to reach 200,000 tons by 2030. And the consequence is that all those antibiotics are making their way into the rivers uh, and, uh, you know, basically through wastewater treatment plants into the river basins, the 58 river basins of China. And um, if you look at uh, Chinese swine farms, you see diverse uh, antibiotic resistance genes of pretty much every type uh, covering, you know, resistance to every kind of antibiotic and every possible kind of, uh, of mechanism that you can really think of. Um, and China is not alone in this. You see high levels of ESPL on farms in India as well, uh, because antibiotics are administered so frequently in, in farm animals in, in India. Uh, this is true in many countries. It's true in Kenya. It's true in, in Vietnam and so forth. Uh, pharmaceutical production um, can also result in, in effluent carrying out lots of antibiotics into the environment. In fact, the concentrations uh, of Cipro that uh, are measured at this particular um, you know, outfall from a pharmaceutical plant in Hyderabad in India uh, by Joachim Larsen and colleagues uh, exceeds what uh, you know, uh, the, the ID clinicians here might hope to achieve in the bloodstream of patients that you're treating with Cipro. So that's what it really looks like. I mean, this is just uh, um, you know, the antibiotics out in the environment once they get out there. And uh, this, this continues unabated because this, these are places where the APIs are actually made. 
So we are seeing this across the board, resistance genes in, uh, in soils in, in, in the Netherlands, unfortunately, uh, because of budget cuts, uh, you know, the similar soil samples in the U.S. have been destroyed, but, uh, you know, otherwise I'm sure we would have found something similar here as well. Um, and the environmental transmission is quite significant. So uh, if you look at NDM1, 20 times greater in the Ganges during the pilgrim season than at other times of the year. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of shedding happening there. And, uh, this was in Rishikesh and Haridwar, where there's a lot of the pilgrims going there, but not in Delhi, where there are really no pilgrims. So um, you always see uh, an elevation in the months when uh, there's a lot of people walking into the river. So I'll stop here. I hope uh, you know, that's sort of shed some light on, on drivers of resistance. But uh, I think the short answer is uh, we think that consumption is important. We think, obviously, the transmission is important. But, uh, but this is clearly a really important One Health uh, problem, which requires a lot more uh, research sort of disentangle what's happening in different places. Um, so the data are all at this website, resistancemap.org, uh, and you can download them whenever you want to. Thank you. Are, are they making any inroads to reduce that? I know they're, the USDA was over there and talking to them, but have you seen any hope that we would see a reduction? Yeah. So, um, I mean, certainly the Chinese government is taking it seriously, and they're doing it in different ways. They are concerned about just sheer antibiotic, uh, sorry, animal consumption in China. Few people realize this, but the Chinese government has an advisory to its citizens to actually eat less meat uh, because they're concerned about you know water, uh, climate, and of course also the antibiotic consequences. But it's not clear that there are actually any changes on the ground with respect to uh, you know, what antibiotics are getting used and how much they're getting used. Uh, that may still take some time. And the particular way in which they get used in China is particularly problematic because they have these hog farms. And then the poop from the hog farms goes into the, into the aquaculture. So it's a single stream of antibiotics fed to the hogs that goes into the aquaculture. And uh, so it's very well documented the high levels of resistance both in the pigs the excreta as well as in the uh, in in the shrimp and so forth that they have so it's uh, it's a very entrenched industry it's hard for the government to just go in and say we're going to do things differently I have one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, most of the uh, antibiotic here essentially uses growth enhancement yes correct? yeah so taking out the antibiotics would immediately have a major economic impact in terms of the per capita production, in terms of pounds. They're, they substitute for other practices, my understanding, in poultry and, and, and pigs and so on. You're absolutely right. So if I could just address that. So um, you know, in the US, for instance, the average daily growth from antibiotics, and you're the veterinarian, you probably know this well, <laughs> was a lot more when you had antibiotics when the absence of nutrition, hygiene, and all the other stuff. Once you have that, the additional contribution of antibiotics is not that great. But when you don't have that on farms in other parts of the world, and not all of them are in that kind of a condition, there are very modern facilities and factory farms in India, for instance, which grow poultry, and they do as well as what you might get in the best facilities here. Um, you don't really need the antibiotics. So it is, a, it is a change that could be made at this time. It just is not a, uh, it's not a focus of, uh, of people's efforts. Yeah, my, I have a question for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, this I thought you were going to be answering the question. No, I mean, <laughs> yes, if you treat the pigs well, then you need less yes. antibiotics. Yes. Um, but uh, I guess if I were just to integrate your great talk with the video and then the, the slide you couldn't, the figure you couldn't put in the journal. So if there's a bad actor, us or China or any other bad actor that just continuing to use large amounts of antibiotics, if all of the rest of the world is kind of like the climate change question, if the rest of the world is behaving well, but we see that video of the, the rapid spread, it does it matter? Like, are, are the antimicrobial resistant organisms or the resistant genes getting around anyway? Uh, the short answer is yes, they are. And uh, if we were a small Scandinavian country here with just, you know, five million people, it probably wouldn't affect us a whole lot. But once you have a large country that imports a lot of food, and then we have hospitals of varying levels and capabilities for infection control, 
then resistance generated in other places does become a problem here. If you had uniformly good infection control here, I mean, at the end of the day, that's where the rubber meets the road. How treat well you well well treat people well too. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So yeah. if you're able to do that, that's fine. But the sorts of things that the Dutch are able to do, which is they have MRSA, they have a search and destroy, they just don't permit it anywhere. That's impossible in this country. We can't, I mean, we have uh, <laughs> 6,000 healthcare institutions. This is not possible. I think uh, feeding or not feeding animals antivirics, uh, I don't think it's, it's a question of hygiene. They have an impact on the GI tract, which is kind of growth promoting effect, which somehow it rebalances the microbiota in the GI tract, which favors uh, better growth. So that's really just as important as the hygiene piece by knocking out the, micro, the microorganisms that are uh, harmful. Who you are? Oh, uh, my name is Salty Pori. I'm from Tufts University. Yeah, just to um, endorse Saul's point uh, that certainly there's a growth promotion, and if we, the studies of the microbiome are linking childhood antibiotics with now obesity, right? And in addition, there are studies out there that by some of our biggest funders, so probably in this room, that are advocating for giving uh, kids Z packs. Well, maybe not, I, you know, but if you give kids Z packs when they're less than five, they mm -hmm. also grow. So mm -hmm. it's not shocking because the ag industry's been doing that for a long time. So, so there's, it's complex, but still, the better the animal welfare, all of the other pieces the less we need them. Do we need them to be that fat? You know, all of those things. Right? Yeah. I mean, just to, to add to that, uh, the standard WHO's treatment guidelines for severe acute malnourished children is to give them antibiotics because that is the appropriate recovery. So we do know that there is a growth effect. The question is whether you need that above what you can do with good nutrition and hygiene. That's, that's a question of, I don't know, that's a question of ethics and where we want to deploy our antibiotics and whether the, the value add from that is really worth the cost in terms of resistance being generated. Well, I think the other one health thing might be new technology is can we alter microbiome without using antibiotics? The treatment of C. difficile is progressing yeah. to a way of essentially a microbiome treatment of C. diff rather than an antibiotic mm -hmm. uh, yeah. treatment. This is essentially the provision of defined feces orally. Uh, would to cure an infectious disease in humans and mm -hmm. one if it is an alternation of microbiome which leads to uh, increased uh, weight gain then one might conceivably have a defined supplement that rather than using antibiotics you're feeding a defined bacterial supplement which is 20 species of bacteria which might act as growth enhancement right we might be able to also identify the mechanisms by which we promote growth and healthy growth rather than obesity um, that antibiotics are, are engendering mm -hmm. without actually using the antibiotics that we need to treat disease, if we could find that mechanism. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Oh, Hello, um, my name is Kendra Doctor, I'm a CDC PHAP and I'm stationed here at New York City Department of Health and TB Control. Um, I have a question for um, Dr. Larson. Um, by the way, all of you guys' um, presentations were amazing and very interesting, and I think um, that you guys are really um, the front lines of putting into action um, when it comes to a One Health approach. Um, Dr. Larson, um, and TB, um, you know, we have a huge um, in, uh, NPR issue. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is, when it comes to developing a vaccine, um, when you think about how our body actually um, tries to get rid of the bacteria, we're not able to actually get rid of it because we just kind of capsulate, capsulate it and make granulomas in our lungs. And so, I'm wondering how can we, because our body isn't able to actually build immunity to it. And so that's the big issue, because you never actually get rid of the disease. Mm -hmm. So when you're developing a vaccine, 
what are some things that we can look for when it comes to mutations um, to yeah. prevent it? Or build immunity. Yeah, super good question. So I think there's a couple of things. There's a study that was, a couple of studies that have, that have come out where people have looked. So first of all, BCG is the only vaccine in humans that's given one time. And we expect everything from it, and it's given once at birth. Other vaccines, you have multiple things of it. So I, there's a couple of different thoughts. One is there's revaccination studies, and there's some terrific non-human primate data and some human data that shows that going back and revaccinating an adolescent that had BCG previously might improve that. Um, we, there's also the field for a long time didn't really think or work very much on post-exposure vaccines. So, you know, once you're infected, you're infected. Um, and so thinking about um, ways that you can be able to, you know, basically you're using, be able to, to figure out how to drive the immune system to basically act like an, yet another drug in terms of being able to contain it. And I think, um, you know, you have different benchmarks for vaccines. You might have, you want it to be something that is just gonna, you know, prevent infection. Well, I think for most diseases, that's gonna be pretty tough. Okay, well, what if you could prevent spread? You know, what if you could prevent dissemination? And then the next, you know, what if you could just, maybe it wouldn't um, uh, impact an individual's own disease course, but maybe it made it so they didn't transmit. And so, you know, that then, you know, if you could, you know, drop the transmission amount. Um, where I work in, I do work in South Africa, the, the, you know, the rates are, you know, um, you know 1,200 per 100,000 um, is the case for, for TB. And so when you've got rates that high, if you could just drop transmission, um, so sort of an altruistic vaccine. So I think the, it's been very interesting to watch the field evolve over the last decade in terms of what, you know, what is, is reasonable and what is, what is reachable. But it is, it is complex because the granuloma that contains the bacteria um, also makes it so other immune cells can't get in, right. oxygen can't get in, drugs can't get in, but, you know, it's, it, but, it's, but it also is containing it, so it's a, it's a back and forth. So yeah, I think it's, vaccine is, vaccines are, are, are difficult, especially for um, pathogens that can, can be latent for decades. Are there any other questions? Hi, uh, Rafael Rodríguez-Castaneda from Faculty of Medicine, University of Geneva, Switzerland. I have a question concerning the PREDICT project. Um, so you said that one of the key outcomes is the fact that you're really building capacity at the front line in these hot spots. Um, how much of that capacity and the whole model of early detection mm -hmm. is really being taken by the country itself? Mm -hmm and how much neighboring countries, or how much do you see your model being spread or extended to neighboring countries in, in, in these hotspots? Because ultimately you said you're working in a number of selected countries, depending on a number of reasons, mm -hmm. but how do you see the model growing? Yeah, is this one working? No? no. Yeah. So I, I think it's a great question, and only time will tell. And really, the rubber hits the road when we are out, right, with, with the external funding and all of those things. So uh, part of the effort has been the, and I couldn't really talk this much about it, but the multidisciplinary effort is that people are being, different kinds of people are being trained. So it's not just the veterinarians that might go to the field or the, um, the laboratorians, be that in, in human or animal labs, but also the social scientists to engage with the communities and to, um, uh, you know, uh, disseminate the results and, and all of the intervention. So um, all of those folks are from the countries and they still want and need jobs. Now what we worry about is that they won't find a, a decent paying job to continue to work. And that's partly why we've also been investing not only with government employees that sort of second or, or work on the project, but with the universities and the structures that have the ability to write grants to grant challenges and things like that so that they will continue the work. If they build their career in that, and I think the 10 years that we will have been operating is, is like a good foundation for them to be building their careers. So that's my hope, but I, we'll have to see. Um, that's both in the countries where we work and as you said, the neighboring countries who have asked and sent their people to be trained. And we see a lot of cohorts being built regionally without functionally being forced to be built by external organizations. They're just doing that on their own. So it's really good. Can I add something? Yeah. 
um, and also with the PREDICT laboratories. In several countries, um, we're working with the human laboratories, public health laboratories, and also the veterinary laboratories. But we also get other laboratories, government laboratories and otherwise, that are asking for our protocols that we're able to um, disseminate those to other, within the same country, to other laboratories. So there is some interest in doing that as well. And, and all those protocols are available to anyone. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing with the Global Viron Project is countries taking that on on their own. I think Saul, who's been leading some of the One Health Workforce activities separate from PREDICT for USAID, can weigh in as well. I, I, I was about to ask you, what's the next phase with regard to the, the Viron Project? Because that mm. would be something that could fill some of this gap. And I, we heard about it several sources, but can you elaborate more on which way this is going? Sure. So right now, uh, the countries, uh, China and Thailand, are exploring their desire and ability and piloting work to do their own, like a Thai Viron project and a China-led Viron project. So I think that's a proof of success. If com countries want to take it on, say this is a, a good concept, let's do it with our own money and our own institutions internally. And we're we're providing those of us on Predict and other things that have the resources are providing protocols, guiding, just backup, consulting. So we're seeing countries getting started. I think there are also there's a sort of the global recognition where the international organizations and folks are starting to say, should we come together to try and do more cross-country, cross-international uh, organizations sort of support for the countries that don't necessarily have the GDP to support it themselves. But there's no, there's no um, real firm answer to that as far as time will tell. Anything else? Yeah, I right. think we'll and uh, we're actually doing remarkably well for a meeting of this complexity. Um, let's say we take a little bit of a break. There is coffee for those of you that run on coffee as fuel. There is physiological space upstairs. And we'll plan to start promptly at 410. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for organizing. Fascinating stuff.